I'd like to start by thanking Tyrone for his uh, wonderful welcome to country earlier today. I want to acknowledge his peoples, the Ngunnawal peoples, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and I bring greetings from my Kwandamooka peoples from Minjuraba or North Shrebroke Island as you may know it just off the coast of Brisbane. It may look like I'm standing here on this stage by myself, but I am not. While you can't see the people standing behind me, I can feel their spirit. My Kwandamooka ancestors and generations of other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been crafting this story for more than 200 years. My story is not my own, nor is it new. It is an old story and one whose time has come. This story is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This statement speaks to me because I was closely involved in its creation. My signature etched into its canvas as I knelt in the red soil of Mutajulu in the shadows of Uluru on the 26th of May, 2017. I remember that moment for many reasons. Seeing the wonder of the yellow-clad gumach and the blues and the greens of the Torres Strait dances, kicking up clouds of red on Anangu land. I remember the looks on people's faces, the quiet smiles, the camaraderie, of people who, only hours earlier, had brought this statement to life. But most of all, I remember how exhausted I felt. In this moment of such importance to my peoples and my nation, I felt a tiredness in my bones and in my soul. I was utterly spent. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, there's something wrong. I should be feeling enthused and energised about what we'd just done. And then I reflected on everything that had happened to get to this point. I had worked with the Referendum Council as it held 13 regional dialogues with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the country. Led by Arnie Pat Anderson, Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson, it was the most comprehensive process ever to engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the hard business of constitutional and structural reform. My job was to capture the stories of more than 1,200 people as they gave their hearts and their minds to the dialogues. Standing at the front of the room at each of the dialogues, I could hear and feel the passion, the grief, the hope, the challenges, and the ideas of people who had spent decades striving for change. I remember helping shape the agenda and co-facilitating the Uluru Convention. Sitting in my room the night before it was all about to start, thinking of all the work that we'd done up until that point, was finally coming to a head. Knowing that more than 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were gathering nearby, preparing to do the hard work of reaching a consensus in the next three days, and I had absolutely no idea what that consensus would be. On the morning of the final day of the convention, Megan read the statement for the very first time. At that point, my emotions were just boiling inside of me. I felt an enormous pride in my people for the work that they'd already done. I felt nervous for the reception. I didn't know what the reception to the statement might be. And I was just hanging on to every single word feeling the tension just ripple through the room. So Megan finishes that reading, and the response was more than 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people getting to their feet in a spontaneous standing ovation. I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. It was that real. It was an emphatic endorsement of this statement. This is truly a historic consensus and a compelling mandate for reform. So all of that was weighing on me in that moment of exhaustion. And then I look up and I see Annie Pat and I see this look on her face. This just says it all. It shows a lifetime of dedication, of sacrifice, of service to her nation. 
It shows the triumph of that moment, tinged with a sadness for those that did not live to see it. And it shows the determination to complete the job of weaving the ancient and modern identities of Australia into a more complete whole. In seeing that look on her face, it reminded me that I've been in this scene for about five min minutes compared to warriors like herself. And in a really strange way, it just allowed me to let that tiredness and exhaustion just slip from my shoulders. And I was able to relax and enjoy that historic moment. But I also knew that the real work was yet to come. I want to make a really important point. If you remember nothing else from this talk, remember this. There's a reason why this statement is with me on this stage today and not hanging in the parliament or the prime minister's office. It is not a submission or a petition to the government. It is an invitation to you, the Australian people. The statement, com the statement commences. We, gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land, or Mother Nature, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom, remain attached thereto, and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possess the land for 60 millennia and this ancient link disappears from history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. A unanimous theme across the dialogues, across Australia, from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, is that First, sovereignty, First Nations sovereignty has never been ceded. At the Ross River Dialogue, about 100 kilometres east of Alice Springs, with three interpreters in the room to take into account the different language groups, people talked about their jukapa, their unshakable connection to their past, present and future. It is their law, and it's their way of life. They did not talk about sovereignty as some sort of abstract political concept. In fact, the word itself was barely mentioned. Not because it is unimportant, but because it is so fundamental to who they are, it is impossible to imagine living a life without it. It has never been and will never be ceded. However, the statement doesn't stop at this notion of just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sovereignty alone. It does not regard it in isolation, but in coexistence with the sovereignty of the Crown. The fundamental reckoning of these two sovereignties is the settlement that has evaded us as a nation since 1788. In welcoming people to the, this year's Gama Festival in northeast Arnhem Land, my brother and Gumach elder Jawa Yunupingu summed up this sentiment beautifully when he said, you will hear us singing tonight and we will be singing to our ancestors who are your ancestors too. We will be singing, them, singing to them to remind them we are here, maintaining our connection to them for their appreciation. And we do this not just for us, but for all of us, because our sovereignty is not a hard and brutal sovereignty. It does not take from others. It does not exclude or steal. Our sovereignty is welcoming. The triumph of this statement 
is not the proposals it, it contains or the consensus that it represents. It is that these words come from a place of deep love for each other as Australians and belief that we will seize this opportunity to reimagine ourselves and remake ourselves as a nation. This is the profound gift that the Uluru Statement from the Heart gives to all of us. The statement continues. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are aliened from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. It would be sadly very easy for me to rattle off a series of statistics that sit behind those words, but instead I'm going to explain the two elements that make these structural problems. These two elements have been on show in the first week of Parliament every year for the last 10 years in the tabling of the Closing the Gap report. This year, Prime Minister Turnbull reported that only three out of seven of the targets aimed at reducing Indigenous disadvantage were on track. The employment gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is actually getting wider. The laws, the policies, the programs and the services aimed at addressing these issues are just not working. And while there are some successes, the current system is in need of comprehensive reform. This failing is the first element of the structural nature of our problem. The second element is harder to see, but it is actually more pervasive. It is the lack of outrage that accompanies this systemic bipartisan failure. It's the shrug of the shoulders that just accepts that the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country is and always will be at the bottom of the pile. It is the morning breakfast TV hosts that suggest that maybe the stolen generations weren't such a bad thing after all. And it is the carefully considered voice to Parliament that is answered with the appointment of Tony Abbott as the special envoy for Indigenous Affairs. In response to these structural problems, the statement proposes three structural reforms. The statement continues. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations body enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It, re it represents our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. The voice to Parliament proposal is the only one that requires a constitutional change and will need a vote of you, the Australian people, in a referendum to succeed. There are no silver bullets for the challenges facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but we have consistently advocated for political representation and genuine self-determination for many decades. We know that the solutions to these challenges will be more effective and more productive when we have a closer say over them. The voice will not diminish the authority of the parliament, but will enhance its effectiveness. It is fair to say it needs some help. In the 10 years of the Closing the Gap strategy, we have seen six prime ministers and 27 premiers and chief ministers come and go. It is hard to take a generational view on issues like children and out-of-home care with that sort of disruption. We need the continuity and certainty of a constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to Parliament 
to ensure that critical decisions are informed by First Nations who are closest to the challenges. The constitutional protection is really, really important. We have seen many representative bodies rise and fall in the past. They were all vulnerable to changes in the political climate, but the problems still remain. Just putting this through a normal legislation process, a voice to parliament through a normal legislation process, is repeating the mistakes of the past, and I'll be back here in 20 years dusting off the same talk. The voice to parliament will scrutinise policy and legislation and will improve the ability of the par parliament to make good laws about us. It will be a strong representative voice that will be benefit not just to the parliament, but to the business and social sectors in ongoing reform. It is a pragmatic and productive proposal. The other structural reform proposed is a Makarata Commission to lead to agreement making and truth telling. This does not require a change to the constitution like the voice to parliament. The Makarata Commission will guide the process of settling the relationship between the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations and that of the Crown. It will establish a national treaty framework that will guide the process of negotiations across the country to give some consistency. The Makarata Commission will also establish a truth-telling process about our nation's history. While we honour our involvement in foreign wars, we turn a blind eye to the frontier wars and the violence that heralded the British colonisation of this country. Some of these conflicts are not that old and our people remember them. Delegates at the Cairns Dialogue remember the midnight raid by Queensland police at Mapoon in 1963, the forced removal of its residents and the burning of their homes to the ground. Truth-telling is not about apportioning blame or generating guilt, but it is the clear realisation that deep reconciliation in this country is impossible without also knowing and naming the truth of our shared history. The statement concludes. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. This is our moment to make our own history one that acknowledges the past properly and imagines a greater future. A future that connects us to each other through truth, love and belief and binds us as a nation to this land and its ancient story. The invitation is here. This is our moment to decide what our legacy is going to be. Tell this story to others. Start a conversation about the, shared promise, about the promise of our shared identity. Express your support at ularuforall.com. Write to your MPs, both state and federal. They need your encouragement. Put a submission to the Joint Select Committee that is currently examining the voice to Parliament and tell them you want your voice heard in a referendum as soon as possible. Let's just get this done. Side by side, let us walk together in a movement of the Australian people.